John Allen, uh, and welcome to Risen Church. Uh, I am, uh, I, I actually, as we were singing that last song, that's a new song, um, and uh, the, the, so sometimes the lyrics of the new song is kind of like you're reading it, you're singing it, you're like, what is this, what's going on? Um, I love the name of that song. You know what the name of that song is? Jesus! <laughs> Exclamation point. <laughs> Like, literally, that's the name of the song. The lyrics are, your name above all names, all things of this earth belong to you. Forever you will reign, highly exalted is the name of Jesus Christ. Heaven and earth declare all praise to Jesus. Yeah. Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. Now, everybody say Jesus. Jesus. So, it is, uh, this is the anthem. Like, I want you to grab the importance and significance of the, that lyric. Just the reality of what's being confessed and declared, because this is the anthem of creation that strikes right at the heart of all that you were designed for. Whether we realize it or not, no matter what's going on, you have been designed for Jesus! Exclamation point. And everything that declares that his name is above all names, that all things of this earth belong to you forever, you will reign highly exalted in the name of Jesus Christ! Heaven and earth declare all praise to Jesus. And when you declare all praise to Jesus, you have realigned and aligned eternally with that which you were created for. There is so much in that. It's not just a theological doctrinal point. This is how uh, we are or what we are redeemed for. So, he is the author of all creation, and all things of this earth belong to Jesus. Exclamation point. So he was, at the, he was the word at the beginning, and he's going to have the final word at the end. And it's going to come with an exclamation point. <laughs> and that's what we're going to look at this morning. So this morning we're continuing in our series through the book of Revelation called Victory Unveiled. Um, and we've come to the end of chapter 16, which is kind of like God's final exclamation point. That's drawn right on the face of all creation. And it comes with, again, the name of Jesus. So last week we took a little break from the series to hear from a few of the uh, godly dads in our church um, for Father's Day. And that was great. Anybody who was here for that? I enjoyed it. I got a lot out of it. Um, so but uh, we're going to dive back into the series of Revelation. So let's quickly recap what we've been diving into or what we've um, been going through here. So uh, just as a reminder for those of you that have been with us and if it's your first time, to just kind of bring you into all that's been happening uh, so that you're right on track with us, all right? So the book of Revelation itself is actually a letter that the Apostle John wrote to the early churches of the first century during an extreme time of political upheaval and persecution. But again, this is no ordinary letter. This is the prophetic account of a very real supernatural experience that the Apostle John had 2,000 years ago. And through this letter and the Holy Spirit, we're invited to experience this very relevant revelation for ourselves today. So John is taken up into the Spirit of God as God pulls back the physical veil and he reveals who is actually in control of all eternity and all that's happening around them then and all that's happening around us now. Not just something that was about uh, the past. It's not just something that's about the future. It's about something that's happening around us even now. And so John is taken up with the Spirit um, and, and given this revelation. And he writes this letter of, his, of, of the account of what he has experienced um, to the early church. To encourage them in difficult circumstances. And to show them that Christ has the ultimate victory, no matter what it might seem like in the world around them then and us now. So it's the reminder that if you are in Christ, you have been rescued, redeemed, equipped, empowered, and commissioned to bring salvation to those drowning in a sinful and chaotic world. That's what this is all about. And so it's important to remember that this letter has a specific context and that it's written to a specific people at a specific time with a specific purpose, uh, which means that it has a specific meaning. All right? And the only way to understand that meaning is to understand its context. In other words, this is not just a letter that was given to the first century church just for the sake of passing it on to a generation thousands of years later that's alive right before Christ returns, right? This is uh, a letter that's written to them 
in the first century. And so its relevance to us now is only applied through the lens of how relevant it was to them then. So we can't make it mean something to us now that it couldn't have been to them then. Amen? So when we realize how directly applicable and relevant it was for them then, then we're also going to treasure this thing, this vision, for us today. We're not just going to put it on a shelf and be like, okay, we're going to wait until things get really bad and we're going to take it off and read it. Right? That's not what this is for. So the thing about Revelation that often gets very confusing and makes it seem like it's and not something that you can really understand or, you know, it's just, it can mean whatever you want it to mean. Um, the, the, the thing about it is that its structure is recursive, okay? So in other words, a book like Genesis or the Gospels and most of the other letters of the New Testament, they're all linear in their progression of events or thoughts and themes, okay? So Revelation, though, circles back on events and major themes over and over and over again. And the way it does that is uh, it develops these events and it, these themes from different angles and from different perspectives on what it's presented. And the reason it's doing that is so that you have a thorough understanding and experience of what's being said here. So this isn't just something for you to just sit back and be told. Like this is one of those things where, and, and this is definitely one of those series, where if you're coming here and you're just expecting some dude to talk for a little while and then you can go get lunch or something, you know, it ain't going to work. You're going to check out. You're going to be thinking about the yachts. You're going to be thinking about the Pelicans flying by, right? But this is, and you're going to miss everything. You've got to lean in with a tenacity that is provided by the Holy Spirit. You've got to kind of lean into what's happening here and ask God Almighty to give you an experience of what we're reading. Follow me? Yeah. So you're awake? Yeah. You got some more coffee? We got it. So, um... Let's, let's, we're going to look at this. Um, we are seeing these visions expanded and expounded upon um, and, and, and these events that we're seeing of both the past and the present and the future. And so we're just over halfway through this letter and we've already seen the end of the world and Christ's return to the earth twice. We've seen it in the seal judgments and we saw it in the trumpet judgments. We'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, though, we kicked off chapter 16, uh, which is another one of those recursive cycles, or the theological word is recapitulation. Big word, just think recap. All right? So, and it's a recapitulation or a recap of the time frame between Christ's first coming and his second coming. That's the period in which we now live. The, it's called the inner advent period. And so we saw it earlier in his return and through the seven seals that were open. And then we saw it again in the seven trumpets that were blown. And chapter 16 now presents the same time frame through another series of seven judgments in the form of the seven bowls that are poured out. So they all describe different aspects and increasing levels of God's judgment that takes place during the same time period. And so they reveal the common themes of history during this inner advent period um, and describe the struggles and troubles that plague the world with corruption, death, famine, poverty, disease, pollution, and demonic torment. Right? And, and we see that God is the one who's unleashing these judgments upon every sphere of creation that's been affected by human sin. So remember, humanity was originally given dominion over creation to take care of it. That's going to be important, especially for this morning. That was our original role in the Garden of Eden. Okay? And so each judgment exposes our failure because we tried to rule in God's place rather than by His authority as stewards of the Garden, cultivating it for His glory. You follow that? All right, so... Each of these judgments reveals the true nature of this fallen world, like handwriting on the walls of creation, declaring that things aren't as they should be. Revelation is a wake-up call given to the church, and it's an encouragement to those who've been awakened to new life, and given those gospel glasses by the Holy Spirit to see and interpret the writing on the wall for the rest of the creation. And so it unveils the reality that the only thing keeping Jesus from coming back in full glory to eradicate wickedness and inaugurate heaven on earth is his mercy towards those who would still repent and receive his grace through Jesus Christ. That's the only reason he hasn't come back yet. It's for those who haven't received grace in Christ yet. 
that he has for them. So that's, it, it, it also, though, what we see here is that it, it also unveils and reveals, especially in the seven bowls of chapter 16, that this world will not last forever. And time is getting shorter and shorter. So this morning, we're going to look at the seventh bowl of God's judgment, which unveils the final judgment on the earth with the return of Jesus Christ. So again, we've already seen this twice, and the next two chapters will go into greater depth even regarding what's being presented here this morning. In many ways, this seventh bowl is like an introduction to the rest of the letter, almost like it spills over into the rest of the book, which unveils the depth and implications um, of Christ's return for both the wicked and the righteous. That's what we're going to see going forward. But, again, what's being presented here is the ultimate judgment on creation that comes with the very presence of God Almighty on the earth. So this is a call to hope and courage for God's people in the midst of difficulty. And it's a reminder of where our true victory actually comes from. All right. You guys caught up? You got all that, right? That fire hydrant, I'm telling you, just open your mouth, you'll get some of it. If you're feeling overwhelmed, then just kind of soak with it all. Um, lean in here. So, turn with me to Revelation 16, uh, verse 17 through 21. We're going to read through this, and then we're going to drop back and walk through it together. And I'm going to point out four things that are going to happen when Jesus returns. Okay? And then we'll close with some practical applications. So, here's what I want you to get this morning. If you get nothing else, here's what I want you to get. The main point actually comes straight out of the Westminster Catechism. <laughs> here's another big word I can't say. Westminster Catechism. See, I can't even. Catechism it means teaching. Um, it comes straight out of that in 1 Corinthians 10 31. So, who can tell me? Who can tell me what the chief end of all humanity is? What is the chief end of man? <laughs> Shane, you did it last time. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, what is, what is the chief end of men? To glorify God and love and enjoy it. Yeah! Good. Give her a hand. That's right. We need to give that on like a Father's Day parable or something. Oh, um, he, he wasn't on it. Wake up! <laughs> Just kidding. Alright, so, um, glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's the chief end of all humanity. Right? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And that's the main point this morning. I'm going to explain what that means. So if you only get one thing from the sermon, that's what I want you to get. Glorify God and enjoy Him forever. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Okay? So as we look at the contents of the seventh bowl, seventh bowl judgment and the end of the world as we know it, <laughs> We're also going to see that the end has in store, or what the end has in store, for those whose chief end is their own glory. You got that? Yeah. So, spoiler alert, it's not joy. Right? So you've got those whose chief end is the glory of God, and there are those whose chief end is the glory of themselves. And we're going to see what that looks like here this morning. So this is a sobering passage. Um, but it's also an exciting passage if you actually do desire the glory of God to reign in the glory of this world. So, Revelation 16, verse 17 through 21. It says this, The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hail, because the plague was so severe. So again, if you've been going through this series with us, then you're probably already noticing things that sound really familiar. 
Remember that this letter was originally written to, again, the early churches, and the way that it would have been read to them would have been all at one time. The whole thing would have just been one shot, boom. And so it would have been in one sitting, read from one guy to the rest of the church, and so the repetitive nature of certain phrases and images would have stuck out, and it would have stuck with them. They would have been easily recognizable, right? And so that's all very intentional here. So we're going to drop back and we're going to walk through these verses and, and point out some of that stuff as well so that you can grasp it. Grasp it. So, verse 17 says, The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. So the first thing I want to point out that's going to happen here is that this is the total realization of God's redemptive plan. Say, it is finished. So God's redemptive plan, first, his redemptive plan is fully realized. It is finished. Remember this all. If you look back at chapter 5, and you remember John tells us that he's weeping bitterly in chapter 5, early on in the book, because nobody was worthy to open the scroll of God's redemptive plan for all creation. He's, he's weeping. But he has this deep sense of despair, and it's palpable as you read it. It's designed to hit you with the thought of creation sort of just languishing in this current state of injustice and darkness forever. Nobody was worthy. Creation is doomed. Nobody could open the scroll. In fact, this is the only section of Revelation that is actually doom and gloom oriented, and it's supposed to be. Right? Somehow John knew that the contents of the scroll that he's seen that no one could open would bring about the redemption of all creation. Yet nobody was worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. And so he weeps bitterly. And his weeping is the ultimate expression of all the sadness and darkness and hopelessness and despair that anyone ever experiences in this fallen world. It's all expressed in that moment of his bitter weeping because no one was worthy to open it. Scroll. It says in heaven or on the earth or even under the earth. No one is able. He's weeping bitterly. But then Jesus, the Lamb of God and the Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave, he was David's root and the Lamb of God who died to ransom the slave, as the song goes. He alone was worthy to break the seals and open the scroll, and that's exactly what he did. And you gotta remember that what you've been reading. In all of these recursive judgments is the contents of God's redemptive plan to save the world and redeem it. And so the first of these three recursive series of seven judgments was unleashed. In other words, all of what we're seeing here is great, it's amazing, it's good, and even the plagues are good because they are just. So these are visions of hope and encouragement for the people of God. This is our victory unveiled in the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so when the full aggregate fury of righteous wrath has been poured out in full strength, then and only then will it be finished. Somebody say, it is finished. <laughs> the only reason any of us can read this passage with any real hope at this point is if your hope is in the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross, which is what he declared when he had sacrificed his life for the sins of all who had placed their hope and faith in him. Remember that? It is finished. This is where he drank the cup of God's wrath dry so that we might drink the cup of his grace. This is the gospel where God became a man. He lived the life we could live. He died the death that we deserve to die. This is what he did on the cross. This is why Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, this is what it's pointing to. 700 years before Jesus came to the earth, this is what it prophesied about him. It's saying, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. What I think is right, what I think is good, seek 
taking my own glory. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. His glory, the glory of the Son of God was so immense. His perfection and purity and holiness was so sufficient and so valuable that it was enough to cover the debt that we owed to justice. The penalty was paid. Restitution was made. It was enough because he and only is enough. That's why salvation is in Christ alone. No one else is enough. Only Jesus. And it was finished. Say it is finished. It is finished. And because it was finished, we know that his grace is sufficient. For by his wounds we're healed. Not only have we been healed, but we've been restored. We've been grafted into new life through his resurrection. Because he conquered death in the grave and he paved the way to eternal life. It starts now with God the Father. Not just one day when we die, but it starts now as we're grafted into this father-son, father-daughter relationship with the creator of eternity. That's what Christianity is. We're filled with his spirit. That's what we're experiencing. See, this victory comes spiritually for those who place their hope in Christ alone. But here, on this day, on that great day of the Lord that's being depicted here in Revelation, that spiritual reality that we experience now in part, that day will manifest physically because His presence will be unmitigated and His glory will be fully revealed on this earth. For those who have not received grace, for those who again live for their own glory, His unmitigated presence will be their undoing. But for those who long for His glory, long for His return, and long for His rule and His reign and His glory, this is our greatest hope. See, for the Christian, the victory has already been won. Even though in this world we still live in what's called the already but not yet. Right? That's why we walk by faith and not by sight. This is the spiritual reality and the spiritual authority that we all walk in. We're going to see this a little bit more as we go forward. Because the victory's already been won. The victory's been won spiritually, but we still live in a fallen world riddled with spiritual warfare as the light breaks into the darkness through the children of light carrying this gospel of grace and good news. So we live behind enemy lines as ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven who carry this gospel into a world that's ruled by Satan and spiritual forces, the spiritual forces of evil that according to Ephesians 6, um, that we talked about in, in, well we already talked about in Ephesians 6, uh, the, the power, the principalities, the spiritual forces of darkness that rule in this world. Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 6, put it like this. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. Following, pay attention, the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Right? But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's a reference to the authority that you walk in as a Christian in this dark world, right? So the state of the current world that we live in is one of impending judgment, right? The prince of the power of the air is a reference to Satan. He is the puppet master of all who have not been set free by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And this is why the final bowl is poured out into the air. You see that? That's what it's talking about. And the temple and the throne that's in this verse is a reference to that unmitigated presence of God upon the earth. These are all design patterns in the Old Testament that are presenting us with uh, his manifest presence. That's what it's a reference to. You guys following me? And so, 
the temple and the throne here, again, it's a reference to his presence, that the king has returned. And to quote from those in the sixth seal, when we drop back into Revelation 6, verse 16, right? We saw his return at that point, right? And so in chapter 6, verse 16, it's they, they, these people, when the presence of God, the glory of God is revealed in full, this is what they say, hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? The answer, of course, to who can stand is those who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Which is what chapter 7 goes into, if you go back and look at that. As Ephesians 2, again, back to Ephesians 2, we're all over the place. I told you, you've got to lean in here. So Ephesians 2, verse 8 through 9, goes on to explain again, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It's all just a receiving of His grace. So the reference to the voice from the temple again, and the throne of God, is a direct reference to that unadulterated presence and glory of the Word of God coming into the earth in royal power. Right? And Jesus is the Word of God in the flesh. We know that from John 1. So, the reference here is to the king returning and establishing his kingdom. It is finished. Exclamation point. Again, it echoes the seventh trumpet judgment of Revelation 11.15. So we saw the seal judgment being echoed. Now we're going to see the trumpet judgment. The seventh trumpet judgment is echoed here. Revelation 11.15. So it, it said this. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So this leads us to the second thing that happens on this great day of the Lord, which is an eternal power shift. So there's going to be a, an eternal power shift upon the earth. Look at verse 18. And there were flashes of rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake, such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. So when you read that, you think, going to be a crazy thunderstorm. Right? That's what you think. Which may be. But again, there's a lot more going on here. So this language is all over both the Old Testament and Revelation, and it's always used to depict a massive shift in power and authority. Right? We saw the seventh seal. I said, I'm, I'm all over the map, so you just got to stick with me. That's why we got slides, right? So, where are you okay? Um, Revelation 8, verse 5, said this. Then the angel, so this was the seventh seal, one of the first series of judgment that we saw that is being recapitulated over and over again. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Then we saw it again, the seventh trumpet, the next series, the trumpet series of the Revelation in chapter 11, verse 19. It says this, then God's temple in heaven was opened. There's that presence again. And the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. There's that unmitigated presence of God on the earth. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. So we're getting even a fuller picture. Okay? It's almost as though we're seeing the same thing over and over again from a different angle and perspective or something. So it's imagery that is pulled from the Old Testament that points to the downfall and judgment of principalities, kingdoms, worldviews, and lofty ideas that set themselves up against and oppose the rule and reign of King Jesus and the kingdom of heaven. This is the world that we live in. Right? So this is the imagery that's pulled from the Old Testament and Revelation, this is the presence of God revealing himself in sheer glory and all opposition disintegrates and flees. So this isn't just a physically literal earthquake and lightning storm. Like, maybe it is. There may well be a physical earthquake and lightning storm and all that stuff. But even then, they will be the physical manifestations of the underlying shift in authority that is happening. Follow me? 
So the main point here is that there will be a major power shift in authority, rule, and reign, such as there has never been before. There have been little ones, right? There have been kingdoms that rise and kingdoms that fall. And in the Old Testament, they're always depicted with this kind of language of earthquakes and lightning storms and all kinds of stuff. Remember when Jesus was crucified on the cross? Remember what happened? Earthquake. Right? It's a foreshadowing. There was an authority shift that took place. It began, in a sense. Right? And that's what's being revealed here, is this physical earthquake. Again, look, a physical earthquake can't be a judgment upon sinful principles. It can't, a, a physical, literal earthquake alone is not a judgment on principles and worldviews and people's hearts in and of itself. Unless it's a symbol pointing to a greater foundation shift of spiritual and physical authority and power. And so that's what's being revealed here. The prince of the air is cast down. So during his earthly ministry, we got a precursor to this. Even when, not, not just when he was crucified on the cross, but when Jesus sent his disciples to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. Right? Remember this to the people? This, this happened in Luke 10. His disciples, he sends them out to preach about the kingdom of God coming near to people. And his disciples come back and they're pumped. Right? And they say, you know, it's, it's Luke 10, in verse 17 and 18, it talks about how the 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. That had never happened before. Nowhere in the Old Testament do you see something like that. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning. And the power shift on earth began with the coming of Christ, King Jesus. He broke into this world at his first coming, and he told them in verse 19, this story in Luke 10, Luke 10, verse 19, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Now, to show you that the language of Scripture is figurative and pointing to deeper things, He's not talking about playing with rattlesnakes. <laughs> right? That's foolishness. But that's what a literal, only physical, literal, non-spiritual, can't understand this from a spiritual paradigm will lead to. Right? So he's talking about here the authority we've been given over the current rulers and principalities of this fallen world, even now, in Christ. See this? So this is the war that we wage in Jesus' name behind enemy lines that liberates the captives and brings sight to the blind and makes the disciples who make disciples of King Jesus exclamation. Right? So what we're seeing here is the final shift in all authority coming to bear upon the earth as the King of heaven and earth physically returns to rule and reign. And as he does, God's redemptive plan is realized and there's an eternal power shift. And then point number three here is that every stronghold of opposition against Jesus as king will disintegrate. Which is, again, the third point. So verse 19, look at this. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and God remembered Babylon the Great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. So, this great city, which we're going to get into in much more detail in the coming weeks, this great city is not just a reference to Jerusalem, or Rome, or New York City, or Virginia Beach. It's the trans-historical, quote, Babylon the Great which is like the collective depiction of all the cities of fallen sinful humanity that oppose Christ and his kingdom and have done so throughout the generations. That's what we're seeing. This great city is a reference to, listen, all socioeconomic, political, religious, and philosophical worldviews, the principalities and authorities that position themselves against the rule and reign of Jesus Christ and his kingdom as they declare their own vain glory and greatness. That's what we're seeing here. 
This great city is founded upon the vain efforts to dismiss God's glory for self-centered self-worship and self-importance. It's the empire state of mind. Right? Like the Tower of Babel attempting to attain greatness apart from God. To be like God in the place of God rather than giving God his due glory. Take it for ourselves. Because these streets will make you feel brand new. Big lights will inspire you. Let's hear it from New York. New York, New York. Right? There's nothing we can do. We'll see in the coming chapters that this great city is directly juxtaposed with the city of God. Or the kingdom of heaven that's going to be established upon the earth in Christ's return. Verse 20. It says, and every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. So this sounds a lot like what we saw in the sixth seal. Revelation 6, again, verse 14, says, The sky vanished like a scroll that's being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So again, this may manifest literally. I'm not saying it's not, but even then, it would be a manifestation of the spiritual reality that's taking place. Okay? Which is that the mountains, again, are symbolic throughout Scripture of obstacles that stand between God and His people. Right? They may be evil forces. They might be kingdoms. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Remember the stepladder? Right? If you don't, I had a stepladder. It had a sign on it. It said mountain. It was the thing that was between me and God, right? And Jesus removed those mountains. This is why when we place our faith in Christ, even if that faith is the size of a mustard seed, we can say to that mountain of separation, be thrown into the sea. Okay? And that's my faith. That's my faith in Him. And so in this world, we face mountains, and by faith in Christ, those mountains are removed spiritually. But when he returns on that great day of the Lord, all spiritual and physical obstacles between God and his people will flee from his presence like the dark retreats from the light. That's what's being portrayed here. For lovers of God and his glory, this is really good. For lovers of themselves and their own glory, this is really bad. And Catch this, if you love your own glory, it means you hate God, because God is about his own glory. You ever heard people say, God's so prideful, he's all about his own glory, he's all about himself. Yeah, he is! And the reason that bothers you is because you're all about yours. That should petrify you. Nugget. <laughs> also, islands in the Old Testament also referred to as coastlands in the Bible, we see this a lot, often referred to godless kingdoms or pagan nations. That's what it's talking about. So when Jesus returns, that's no longer going to be a thing. So even those are gone. See this? So finally, the last thing we see here is that, verse 4, I'm sorry, the point 4, not verse 4, um, the, the, the last thing that we see, the last point here, is that the severity of God's justice will be in perfect proportion to the severity of human sin. That the severity of God's justice will be in perfect proportion to the severity of human sin. So verse 21. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hail, because the plague was so severe. Again, this this echoes what we saw in the seventh trumpet of Revelation 11. And it's another reminder of one of those plagues on Egypt in the Old Testament where one of them was a great hailstorm. And so the difference here is that this hail isn't just judgment upon one nation who's opposing the people of God or oppressing the people of God. It's judgment on the entire earth who's been oppressing the people of God. That's what we're seeing here. So also... You know, there's a little thing here that's interesting. You just kind of read over it, I think. I, I know I have for years. Just read right over this. Why are these hailstones 100 pounds? Like, that seems like an arbitrary fact. Like, what's that about? It seems to be like a strange metric to throw out there, right? 
Like if I'm telling you how I got caught in a rainstorm and I say like all of a sudden it started raining and each drop weighed about 100 pounds, right? You'd think I was just being hyperbolic. Like you'd just think that was a heavy rainstorm. Like he got soaked, right? That's what you would think. Um, and I think, yeah, there's some of that's going on here. Um, but there's also something more intentional going on here that we would easily miss, but the original readers would not have. And that is that the Roman talent represented about 100 pounds of silver. Think about that. Roman talent of that day represented about 100 pounds of silver, which would have evoked a lifetime of wages for the common worker of the day. It literally represented a person's weight in wages, raining down upon them in judgment. It would have reminded them of Romans 6, verse 23, which says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, the severity of this judgment is in direct proportion to what is owed. Even though they're crying out and saying, This isn't fair! It's too severe! But it's exactly in proportion to what they deserve. Jesus himself used language like this to describe what the day of his return would be like in Matthew 25. He said it would be like a man who entrusted his property to three servants and gave each of them a different amount of talents according to their ability. Again, a talent represents a hundred pounds of silver in that day. After a long time, the master returned to settle accounts and two of the servants had stewarded those talents that they were given, and he stewarded them well, and he multiplied them, right? And the master's response to both of them is, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. I love this because a talent is a lifetime of wages. That's not being faithful over a little. That seems like it's a big deal, especially since some of them even got five talents, right? The reality, though, is that compared to what will be given in eternity, it's very little. Right? And so, the third servant, though, comes forward. So he does this and he says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will send you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He says that to the first two stewards or servants who stewarded their talents well that came from the master. So then the third servant comes forward and says, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So the master represents God here, and the servant represents people. And I want you to see that this servant's bitterness is rooted in his own selfishness. He accuses the master, who represents God, of reaping where he did not sow. Why would he do that? Because he thinks it's all about him. He thinks that he is himself responsible for all that he has and deserves the glory that it belongs to him. He's the glory for him. That he is or should be the master because he would be a better master than the real. That's the heart behind all sin. That is the heart behind it all. Let's read the rest of the parable. Matthew 25, verse 25 through 30. This is the parable that Jesus, this is what Jesus continues to tell. Verse 25. This is the, the, the servant speaking to the master after telling him that, that you know, you're gathering where you scattered no seed and reaping what you did not sow. And then he says, so I was afraid and I went and hid, hid your talent in the ground. Here. You have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have at least invested, and if that's true, then you ought to have at least invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who will be who has, will, be, will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And to cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Here's what I want you to see. It's the servant's resentment of the master that led to distrust and outright rebellion. I read a quote recently that said this, if you look for offense, you will find it. A heart whose posture is one of constant defensiveness and suspicion will never find rest. Perpetually offended people live in self-inflicted misery. That's the state of this person's heart. It was born of his own self-centeredness. As a result, he buried his God-given talent in that which is wasting away the things of the earth. His self-centered pride led to his worthless, earthly investment. It led the servant to do exactly what Jesus told us not to do in Matthew 6, verse 19 through 21, where, where he said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the servant sent the good gifts God gave him into that which carries no eternal reward, and it was the direct symptom of his heart, which is bitter towards God, because he was not God and wanted to be God. And isn't that again the root of all that's been twisted in this world? As the book of James put it, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. That we were created to tend the garden of creation. Human flourishing happens when the good gifts given to us by God are stewarded for His glory. This is where our relationship with Him thrives. This is where we live and breathe and love and operate the joy of God. The breakdown happens when we subvert that and we try to steal His glory for ourselves. That's when bitterness and resentment and distrust ensue and humanity becomes worshipers of themselves and haters of God. And then blame God for their predicament. This theme really gets fleshed out in the next few chapters, but ultimately what we're seeing here is that the glory thieves receive exactly what they're owed when Jesus returns to settle accounts. And catch this, we are them, but for the grace of God. The question then here is, are you investing your time, your talent, your treasure into that which brings God glory? Or are you operating in the joy, or, or are you in that, operating in the joy of the Father of lights? Because that doesn't just happen one day when he returns, it happens now. Right? It's a joy that's like incomparable. When you know that what you're doing pleases him, there is no luxury vacation on this planet that can top that. And I'm not against luxury vacations. Like, we God love it, right? But even in that, like, that's worthless if you know that it is opposed to Him. There's no peace there. Does that make sense? So the question then is, again, are you investing your time, talent, and treasure into that which brings Him glory? And you're operating in the joy of other of lights? Or does your life represent a striving for your own glory and a dismissal of the things of, kingdom, of the kingdom of heaven? That's when anxiety happens. Right? It's all about me. My future is all about me. It's all up to me. And you know that you're not good enough to do that, to deal with that. And it, it creates an insane amount of anxiety. But when you know that your life is a stewardship of the kingdom, or that he cares about the things that you care about more than you do, <laughs> there's a joy that is incomparable there. The things that God loves, those are the things that I'll hold an eternal reward and build with an heavenly interest. So the truth is that none of those other endeavors really satisfy. None of the things of this world satisfy, right? The lust of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those things disappoint. They're all going to leave you wanting like elusive shadows of temptation or like waters that never quench. They only leave you thirsty. Right? As Tim Keller put it, seek God first and you'll get satisfaction thrown in. Seek satisfaction first and you'll lose both. God and satisfaction. Or as John Piper put it, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in 
Or as St. Augustine put it, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And of course, as Jesus put it, <laughs> seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all else will be added unto you. And as Psalm 37, 4 puts it, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now why? <coughs> God, I want you to get this. If you delight yourself in the Lord, it's going to give you the desire of your heart because He is the desire of your heart. You don't delight yourself in the world in the Lord so that He can give you the things of the world. You delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you Himself. Which is, and then everything else is experienced in its fullness in light of Him. This is the joy of the stewardship, of being with and operating on a mission with and delighting in our Heavenly Father, not just as servants, but as sons and daughters. This is our great commission. This is how we glorify God and enjoy Him forever. God has strategically designed and gifted you for this unique, custom-made role in His great commission. He's not necessarily asking you to become a pastor or an overseas missionary. For some of you, maybe. Awesome. Let's go. But ultimately, his call is for you to do everything for the glory of God and to enjoy him in it. And whatever you're doing, if you're a doctor, if you're a nurse, if you're a lawyer, entrepreneur, salesman, mechanic, soldier, mother, father, son, daughter, teammate, friend, whatever it is, we do all for his glory, for his kingdom, for his purpose, and we enjoy him in it all. Stewarding, cultivating. Using the time, treasure, talent that he's given us for his glory and entering into his joy in the process. And when we fall short, we repent, we say, I'm sorry. And he's like, I know, I love you. Let's get up and walk this thing out. Right? Charles Spurgeon, and I'm closing with this. Woo! He once highlighted how good, or, or how God distributes talents differently according to ability, and how the goal isn't to be better than one another, but to simply be faithful with what God has entrusted to us. And he compared those we normally think of as heroes in the faith to the normal everyday faithful, and how they'll be received in heaven. Through this, this is great. Here's what he said. I'm closing with this. Here comes Whitfield. The man who stood before 20,000 at a time to preach the gospel, who in England, Scotland, Ireland, and America has testified to the truth of God, and who could count his converts by thousands, even under one sermon. Here he comes, the man that endured persecution and scorn, and yet was not moved. The man of whom the world was not worthy, who lived for his fellow men, and died at the last for their cause. Stand by angels and admire while the master takes him by the hand and says, Well done, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. See how free grace honors the man whom it enabled to do valiantly. Hark! Who is this that comes there? A poor, thin looking creature that on earth was a consumptive, which means like a sickly person. There was a hectic flush now and then upon her cheek, and she lay there long years upon her bed of sickness. Was she a princess's daughter? For it seems heaven is making much stir about her. It is not. No, she was a poor girl that earned her living by her needle, and she worked herself to death, stitch, 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 from morning to night, and here she comes. She went prematurely to her grave, but she is coming like a shock of corn, fully ripe into heaven. And her master says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful in a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. She takes her place by the side of Whitfield. Ask what she ever did, and do you find out that she used to live in some back garret town, down some dark alley in London? And there used to be another poor girl who would come to work with her. And that poor girl, when she first came to work with her, was a volatile creature. And this sickly consumptive child told her about Christ. And they used to, when she was well enough, to creep out of an evening to go to chapel or to church together. It was hard at first to get the other one to go, but she used to press her lovingly. And when the girl went wild a little, she never gave her up. She used to say, oh, Jane, 
Oh, Jane, I wish you loved the Savior. And when Jane was not there, she used to pray for her. And when she was there, she prayed with her. And now and then, she was stitching away, read a page out of the Bible to her, but poor Jane could not read. And with many tears, she tried to tell her about the Savior who loved her and gave himself up for her. At last, after many a day and hard persuasion and many an hour of sad disappointment and many a night of sleepless, tearful prayer, at last she lived to see the girl profess her love to Christ. And she left her and took sick. And there she lay till she was taken to the hospital where she died. When she was in the hospital even, she used to have a few tracks and she would use them to give to those who came to see her. She would try, if she could, to get the woman to come around. And she would give them a trap. When she first went into the hospital, she could creep out of bed. She used to get by the side of one who was dying. And the nurse used to let her do it. Until at last she got too ill. And then she used to ask a poor woman on the other side of the ward who was getting better and was going out if she would come and read a chapter to her. Not that she wanted her to read to her on her own account, but for her sake, she thought it might strike her heart while she was reading it. At last the poor little girl, or at last this poor girl died and fell asleep in Jesus. And the poor consumptive needlewoman had said to her, well done. Whew. Jesus said, well done. And what more could an archangel have said to her? She had done what she could. See then, the master's commendation and the last reward will be equal to all men who have used their talents well. Ah, if there be degrees in glory, they will not be distributed according to our talents, but according to our faithfulness in using them. May we glorify God and enjoy Him forever.